när jag sitter hemma i sängen i Norge och hört om alla som har det vont och du ser det på nyheterna och du hör om ting så har jag tänkt att uh, det finns många människor som uh, blir fött och så har det en uppgift i livet och så dör de och that's it. This was the first scene of the first episode of Aftenposten's critically acclaimed, award-winning international success, Sweatshop. The plot is simple enough. We wanted to take three average Norwegian teenagers outside their comfort zone and put them in a textile factory in Cambodia and have them live with the textile workers there. This series has taken on a life of its own. It's become an incredible journey, it's still ongoing. And, uh, but getting the footage that you saw just now, I have to say, it was no easy uh, task. People might hunger for bad news, for negative news stories, and God knows that most news stories are uh, negative. But the problem with bad news as opposed to good news is that it just doesn't stick in the sense that it doesn't change you, it doesn't change the way you act, then change your values. Uh, and on an unconscious level, your brain is working really hard against anyone trying to tell you a negative story. I want to take you back in time to a much younger version of myself in Kenya, uh, in Nairobi, the capital. We uh, went there on a study trip to visit slums, to meet people's rights advocates, and to also visit the tribunal, the UN tribunal uh, in Tanzania after the Rwanda genocide. And all of this made uh, an incredible and permanent impression on me. I had obviously seen slums before on TV, so I knew that people were living in them in horrible conditions. And uh, we had learned in school about the genocide in Rwanda, so I knew about that as well. Uh, and I knew that people were being imprisoned for their political beliefs and tortured and killed. But it didn't stick until I saw it uh, with my own eyes, and it's still uh, very much with me. I uh, got home that year uh, just in time to celebrate Christmas with my family and have a major meltdown on them and my poor mother and anyone else that I met during those holidays. Uh, I thought that their... Uh, problems, their challenges, were completely irrelevant and so trivial. Uh, this was Christmas, cakes weren't baking properly, people were late for church, people were late for dinners. And if you remember, this was also the year of the huge energy crisis in Norway. That fall, the price for electricity uh, rose really fast and people were completely obsessing over their electrical bills, while in my mind, people were in prison and in slums, dying all over the world with no electricity at all. And I tried to get this message across to the people surrounding me and it just didn't stick. And all the time, without me even knowing it, their brains were working tirelessly against me to keep all these negative stories out, to stay positive. And that was also very much the case with our uh, cast in Sweatshop. Det er jo helt sinnssykt mye større, det er jo ikke, altså alt er jo bare jord. Ja. Du ser bak der også, det er jo ja, det er så støvt det. Det kan jo være derfor folk går med munnbind. Hvor mange er det som dapper her hvert år da? As you can see, we had some work ahead of us. This was their first reaction upon arriving in Cambodia, and they're pretty naive, they're pretty closed. They are not very sensitive to their surroundings, and their brain is uh, unconsciously building a wall against these new impressions. My point is that it's hard to get through. You have to have a plan. And most people that are telling stories, uh, they will tell you if you ask that it's really, really hard, even if it's a positive story, even if it's a negative story. And most people don't succeed. And why is it? Is it ignorance? Uh, is my, are my family and friends uh, horrible people? Are the cast of Sweatshop uh, spoiled brats? Uh, not able to show empathy or compassion or understanding for other people. I don't think that's the case. I think that distance plays a big part in these things. Trying to tell a story from the other side of the world with, other, with people from the other side of the world that are of no concern to us is really, really hard. But the biggest 
problem and the biggest obstacle to overcome in telling any story, good or bad, is your brain. We are just hu human. It's the way we're wired. And 80 to 90% of us are predisposed to what is known as the good news, bad news effect, which means that we're more likely to take in a good story as opposed to a bad story. And Dr. Tali Sharat, based in London, did a study eight years ago where she measured the effect that good news and bad news have, the strength it has to change our beliefs when we are told either good or bad news. And what she found was pretty astonishing. She found that uh, the way that the brain takes in good news is that with twice the power that it uses taking in bad news, which in my mind translates to it's really, really hard to tell a bad story because they won't stick. They also were able to locate the parts of your brain that control and mediate this effect, and they were also able to disrupt it, to, to interfere with it, using transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's a tough word. Uh, and seeing as there's not much of that going on in film and television production, we had to figure out another way to get our message across and try and beat our audience brain. So we came up with a plan. And obviously, the first thing we did was to choose our cast. And we needed our cast to be 100% relatable to the audience that we wanted to reach. We needed the audience to see these kids and think that this could be me. This could be me in that, in that uh, sweatshop in Cambodia. The second thing we did was to take our uh, cast, our nar narrators, and put them in the story that we wanted them to tell to the cameras and tell to the audience so that they could share everything that they were experiencing. We took them to a market and let them wander around in the chaos there. We introduced them to Sok Chi, a 25-year-old uh, worker, and then we told them, the girls and Ludwig, that tonight you are going to sleep over at Sok Chi's house, and she doesn't have any beds. She doesn't have a bed for herself, so you'll be sleeping on her concrete floor. And all of this was a surprise to our cast. They didn't know anything, and we didn't want them to come into these situations uh, being prepared in any way. We wanted everything to be raw. We needed a, a clean palette, so to speak, to work with. And uh, even though we did all of these things, surprising them with all these horrible and new impressions, we didn't always get the reactions that we were looking for. Jag och föredrar en säng. Det var inte så gott. Jag är synes på en måte synd på oss som har det sånt, men för allt jag vet så kan det vara att ha lugga sånt i alla år och är vant med det. Ja, hon är vant med det. Hon eh, har ju säkert aldrig sovit på något bättre, så hon vet ju kanske inte hur det är eller. So even after trying to sleep on a concrete floor for one night these kids were still rationalizing in a big way. You can see their brain is working tirelessly to keep all these negative impressions out. To the point that they're actually saying, well, she might not have ever slept in a comfortable and cozy bed, a soft bed like the one that I have at home, so therefore she is incapable of noticing <laughs> that the concrete floor she's sleeping on is hard and feels not very soft at all. And that's, that's wonderful work on the mind's part. I have to say, though, that uh, one of our cast, Ludwig in the middle, he had a minor breakthrough uh, during the sleepover, and you can see a small crack in the wall. And we were really, really happy. We are thinking, yes, finally, we're going somewhere with these kids. But I think it's so incredibly tight that you have to draw it down to understand it. Yes, yes, yes. That you have to live in that bubble in Norway and think that... I mean, you think that you know. 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 Sadly, though, it didn't last very long. The next day, after spending a night trying to sleep on a concrete floor, we took them to work at the factory. And you can see the workers arrive early in the morning to huge compound out, uh, compounds outside of uh, the capital, Phnom Penh. And uh, when they started working, it was as the wall was building around them once again. And come lunchtime, it was thick and yay high, and they were again unable to take in uh, anything that we threw at them. 
Jag är vant där då, de som jobbar här har ju att göra det här varje enda dag. Kanske inte så grejt för kroppen vår då som det är er för dem, för de är er ju vant till det. Det att sy är er ju den värsta jobben här i världen. Det att sitta med en symaskin. Det är er ju mycket andra ting som är er värre. Och så sitter det ju. Vi sitter hela dagen, det är er inte nog fysisk hårt slitsamt på en måten. Jo, men nu är er det ju sån att de här nere är vant till det. Alltså de har inte de sitter ju inte på stolar eller skällor. Jag är er vant med att sitta i en stol oavsett vad och inte en krock. Jag ligger ju i en säng och inte på golvet alltså. Ja, nej. Yeah, you, it's a, you're allowed to laugh. But at this point the producers were not laughing. They were getting kind of frustrated. I admit that we wanted them to have this journey. We wanted them to be naive and closed and unsensitive because that's what we are when we're not there them, uh, there as they are. And we wanted them to have that journey with the audience and then get to a point where they would take everything in and would they and where they would reflect and that we'd had the audience with them on that journey. But now we were starting to worry that uh, they were never going to get there, and this was the goal of this entire operation. So we had them work a bit more, and then some more. And then we took them to a local supermarket to have them figure out that the prices at that supermarket weren't all that different from the prices they're used to at home, or more comparable to US or UK supermarket. But the biggest issue was that they had gotten paid that day for working one day at the factory. And this amount of money was nowhere near what they needed to buy food. So they were standing in this supermarket with a piece of broccoli saying, we can't afford this, we can't buy food, what are we going to eat? And they were tired from working, they were tired from not eating, they were tired from us throwing all these impressions at them. And then we took them to a community center, a shelter that takes care of people who work in the textile industry and had these workers tell their stories about the horrible conditions in some of these sweatshops. And then our cast uh, had the opportunity to interview them and they were told how this life affects them and how working uh, in that manner affects them and their families. And you can slowly see that things were starting to sink in with them. The wall was breaking down and they were overwhelmed and they were starting to take all of these impressions in. And finally, we had uh, achieved our goal, which was to break down that wall entirely. De här nere är er vant till det. Alltså de har inte de sitter ju inte på stolar eller skällor. Ja, nej. Jag tänkte på många gånger att det att det finns så jävligt mycket unödvändig mänsklig i världen för det Jeg har jo på at ingenting, de, de, de gjør ingenting i løpet av livet sitt. Jeg har tenkt mange ganger. Men når du begynner å intervjue en person, så er hun jo akkurat like mye verdt som det jeg er. Men hun var 19 år. Og forteller at moren hennes døde fordi hun sulta i hjertet. Hva slags liv er det? Hva slags start på livet er det? Hun, hun, moren hennes døde ikke av fordi hun hadde sykdom eller fordi hun ble drept. Hun sulta i hjelp fordi hun ikke hadde penger til mat. Jeg klarer ikke mer. Hadde den 19-åringen vært med så hadde jeg gitt opp. Jeg har sett den footage a hundred times, probably mer, og det er still sort of gets to me, and it really, really got to the audience as well. It resonated with them in a huge way. First in Norway, and then we saw it start to pop up around the world in different blogs and magazines. And suddenly, uh, Ashton Kutcher, who you all probably know, a huge actor, posted it on his Facebook page to his somewhat 18 million followers and gave us an enormous increase in traffic, obviously. And we were starting to think that the audience were now looking at these kids and thinking, what if this was me? This could easily be me, which was our goal all along. And they were also starting to think, and we got tons of texts, tons of emails, phone calls from all over the world, from people having their brain beaten and and loving this content and crying over it. And they were thinking, what is my role in this? 
am I in some way contributing to these people's misery by the life that I live or by the clothes that I buy, and what can I do? And this goes double for our caste, obviously, and very literally, because uh, Ludwig now has the workers' minimum wage demand of 2013 uh, tattooed on his ankle. And it has since risen, so he might have to get a new tattoo. But uh, my point is that to get audiences to engage in a predominantly negative storyline, you have to be aware of two things. First and foremost, your cast. Your cast has to be relatable to the audience. And then you have to take that cast, that narrator, and have him or her in close proximity to the story you want them to tell. Preferably in the middle of it, like we did. It's a, it's a really magical effect. And then you'll have to beat both their brains. First, the narrator, the cast, you have to get them to take all this in. And then, if they're able to convey that in a reliable, believable way, then you'll have an army of brains to beat in your audience, and hopefully you'll be successful. But the strongest change is undoubtedly in the cast, in these three kids, and in the crew, and in me, uh, returning from Kenya when I was 21. Because it has changed us in a huge way. It's, it's made me think different, view people different, view everything different, and change my values. And, and this goes also for, for these three. And I'm starting to think that that effect is almost impossible to recreate, to get that level of change in someone and to have your brain beaten like that. You had to be there, and most people aren't. So my advice to you is to go out. Go out of your comfort zone. Go out of your bubble. It doesn't have to be on the other side of the world. You can go outside your zone in your own town and get that extra level of perspective. And if you do, I promise that it will change your life forever. And thank you for listening.